The Month of Love. Time for some Capcom games. Yeah, it isn't hyperbole to say that they are my favorite developer, what with a wide lineup of mostly excellent games, fun characters to play as, rocking soundtracks that define music within the interactive medium, and a whole plethora of other reasons. It doesn't matter what era, most of the time, looking at you. <laughs> Capcom has always had at least one good release within the year, whether from a long-running franchise like Resident Evil or their fighting games, Street Fighter, the Versus franchise, to their less remembered projects like Ashura's Wrath, Haunting Ground, or Zack and Wiki. They are a multi-talented bunch there over at Capcom, delivering on a lot of genres for a lot of platforms. So as a bit of a celebration for the channel's anniversary, let's look at some of those less remembered entries in their famous catalog. Whether because Hindsight was 2020 or the last game in the franchise killed the whole thing off. That may be a bit too on the nose for that second hint, as we already know that today's topic is Survivor. For a bit of a speed run through grounds probably already covered by me, but definitely by other people, yada yada, Sweet Home marks one of the first and probably definitive entries into Survival Horror, etc, etc, Resident Evil is developed as a spiritual follow-up to it solidifying the burgeoning genre. This is a road I'll inevitably cover when making a video on Remake, so I'll do like I did for No More Heroes with Killer7 and leave that alone for the time being. The most important factoid to bring up is that Sweet Home's combat was done within Dragon Quest, or Shin Megami Tensei if so inclined, esque first-person turn-based battles. Originally, Resident Evil was meant to be an FPS kind of title, but was dropped for the third-person view much like the original co-op feature planned for the game. That's where our connection to the progenitor stops, as Survivor is in much closer relation to Resident Evil 2, 3, and the prototype game that Capcom and Nintendo were working on for the Nintendo 64. See, around the time of 99, our starting point for this journey, Capcom had just released 3 Nemesis, the follow-up to Resident Evil 2. Nemesis as a mainline title is the odd one out, as while it is considered a numbered game, holding more importance developmentally to the Resident Evil franchise as a whole than, say, games that use a subtitle like Revelations, it was mostly thrust into that role, squarely because of the second coming of our lord and savior, the PlayStation 2. Recounted by VG247, the publisher had multiple Resident Evil projects on the go, including a team under Hideki Kamiya working on what was planned to be the next core Resident Evil game. The game was loosely set on a luxury cruise liner and had a general plot where Hunk was attempting to bring back a sample of the G-Virus, Kawamura said of Kamiya's project. In mid-1998, Kamiya's crew realized their project would be finished far too late for a PlayStation 1 release, and didn't have time to upgrade to the PlayStation 2. It had to be shelved. Code Veronica was a Dreamcast exclusive game, the scenario for Zero was just getting started, and Mr. Kamiya's team was forced to go back to the drawing board to design for the PlayStation 2. This meant that fans on the PlayStation would have to wait several years for the next sequel, a scenario that Capcom wanted to avoid, Kawamura remembered. Nemesis was essentially a spin-off reworked into what it was, a very green team led by Kazuhiro Aoyama taking off of working on a Gaiden title to fill the time gap that the cancelled Kamiya follow-up would have taken. And for the most part, this audible worked as 3 Nemesis was commercially and critically successful. But not as much as 2. For this section, prepare for some math and assumptions on my end. So, going off of Capcom's annual company report for 99, we know that the worldwide sales of the Resident Evil franchise were 11 million. Discounting 3 Nemesis, seeing as it came out within the year, that means we can guess that the sales breakdown between Resident Evil 1 and 2 are about half and half, with 2 slightly edging out its predecessor. However, the breakdown between Resident Evil 2 on PlayStation 1 and Nintendo 64 is possibly a lot less even, probably being a split of three-fourths for the PlayStation version. How we can gather that is on the same report, Capcom breaking down their sales by hardware, this pie chart showing that most of the company's output was bought for the PlayStation 1, followed then by the Dreamcast and Game Boy. Sales for Nintendo 64 were a low priority, thus providing a bit of insight into why Project Zero had the development that it did, as going multi-platform with the quote-unquote traditional Resident Evil games was a bit of a gamble. 
This brings me to the 2008 IGN Capcom sales report, where we find some damning numbers. First off, around this time, Resident Evil was Capcom's most successful franchise, hitting around 35 million in sales. Of the games in the series, Resident Evil 2 is the highest seller, with around 5 million, then followed by 3 Nemesis, which had 3.5 million. Now, didn't I just say that 3 Nemesis wasn't as successful as 2? 1.5 million away isn't that much. Well, it is when you are the third game in the franchise, and are being beaten out by Resident Evil 1. The original Resident Evil is behind 3 Nemesis at 2.7 million sales, but that is just counting the original version. That's not counting the DualShock or Director's Cut sales, hitting for 1.2 and 1.13 million a pop, meaning total sales for Resident Evil, not counting Remake as I would consider it different enough, is actually 5.08 million sales, basically sharing the spot with Resident Evil 2 and being beaten by it if we include Nintendo 64 sales for the sequel, equaling that 11 million from earlier. And to add further salt to this wound, Code Veronica's Dreamcast sales were 1.14, with Code Veronica X reaching 1.4 for a total of 2.54 million in sales. That's a downward trend. The numbers don't lie, and they spell disaster for you! Even removing all the math I did and just counting the original versions of the games, there's a spike in sales for Resident Evil with 2, then a steady decline with 3 Nemesis and Code Veronica. Back to the front, that probably explains why Hideki's team went with such a drastic design deviation for the original Resident Evil 4, giving us Devil May Cry. The formula had grown stale. Not enough for it to stop making gangbusters, but there was a noticeable drop-off that experimentation would be welcomed. As Cassidy puts it from Bad Game Hall of Fame, ultimately the conclusion reached by the publisher was that upcoming Resident Evil titles shouldn't stray too far from their successful survival horror formula, at least not where it came to the mainline entries anyway. There's a lot of games I've mentioned up to this point, but the one that sticks out now is the previously untitled Project Zero. Resident Evil Zero. Back before all the hubbub I just covered and with the start of this franchise, Capcom already had plans for a prequel to Resident Evil that would be featured on the 64DD. Time wasn't kind to the peripheral, see a few of my other videos, so Capcom opted for the base 64 as it could take advantage of a concept called zapping. This is where game formats actually played an important role back then, as while discs offered more space, they had to deal with load times. Cartridges, meanwhile, never had to load, but there was less memory for the game to be stored on. That's why a lot of PlayStation 1 games had FMV cutscenes while 64 games didn't, but you had to deal with less downtime in the latter as opposed to loading with the former. That would mean, say, if you wanted to use two playable characters that you could switch between to solve puzzles or fight enemies, there would be chunks of gameplay on a disc dedicated to loading while a cartridge would be close to instant. Resident Evil Zero producer Tetsuya Minami brings this up in an interview with CVG. This game was initially being developed for Nintendo 64, so the concept was to create a Resident Evil that could be stored on a cartridge. The big point is that at the time, PlayStation 1 was the main platform, but if you have two characters and switch between them, you have to load each time you switch. But if you use Nintendo 64, there's no need for loading because of the cartridge. That's why they came up with the idea of having two characters, because of the cartridge. Funnily enough, Zero's production would be halted for the 64 in 2000 and switched to the unknown Dolphin console Nintendo was developing at the time, leading to the prequel seeing the light of day on the GameCube. Out of all the games I've brought up, Zero is the most important one as it wasn't solely a Capcom creation. It was co-developed between them and a developer by the name of Toze. That means Capcom was not only a okay with experimentation when it came to Resident Evil, even for their mainline titles, but was more than willing to let other developers hold the reins. Toze is... an anomaly in the traditional game developer field. A few descriptions can be thrown their way. Ghost Developer and Cutout Company, the two best ones. 
An interview with former employee Daniel Ald says it best. Toze was a cutout company, meaning they would be contracted by large game publishers to develop complete products, but would not put their name on it when released. The programmers would only get satisfaction by looking at the scrolling credits at the end of the game where they could watch their pseudonym names drift up the screen. It's exactly like a ghostwriter. Instead of Toze getting the credit, all of it goes to the company that contracted them. That goes for money as well. Daniel mentioning that his base makings in a month of the company were $1,450, so $17,400 a year, while the president was incredibly wealthy, which created a stark dichotomy with the rank-and-file workers, of which I was one. While the president was fussing over where to park his 10th boat, some of the programmers were paid so little, they actually had to stop eating near the end of the month when their money ran out. The managers were in the typical salaryman mode of work, where they would show up at 5 a.m. and stay until 1 or 2 a.m. In Japan, it is said that the company is your mother and takes care of you, so you owe it your full devotion. At one point, I asked one of the managers, who was married with two children, doesn't your wife mind that you're never home? He replied simply, she minds, and left it at that. Toze is pretty insular in nature, with not a lot of information coming out of the company except for in these kinda leaks. I say this because Toze has been in the industry since the birth and fall of Rome dating back to the 1980s with Sasuke vs. Commander. This has hard proof, by the way. Back to Bad Game Hall of Fame, their debut title would appear to be 1980s arcade cabinet Sasuke vs. Commander, produced on behalf of SNK. Interestingly, this is one of their few early games they fully admit to having developed on their website's company history page, possibly due to the fact that they weren't yet billing themselves as a ghost developer when they were first established. Like, and this is a tangent. Despite Toze's size and reach, a clear viewpoint into the company isn't available. This company, having supporting developer roles for Animal Crossing New Horizons, Zelda Breath of the Wild, Afro Samurai, Fire Emblem Fates Birthright and Conquest, and a whole bunch of mainline and spin-off Final Fantasy and Dragon Quest games, is a proverbial ghost. They are just as likely to work on a hit game as they are bargain bin trash which was how their company was laid out on the ground floor. Toze was interested in working with the 3DO during the mid to late 90s, mostly because they bought into the hype of console creator Trip Hawkins saying that it was the future, it wasn't, and also because Toze was a bit sheepish when it came to venturing into a fully 3D space. Daniel mentions that the floor I worked on was sparsely staffed, about 20 people total, Half were working on cartridge games for the established platforms, the rest on 3DO. The cartridge programmers were on one side of the floor and worked with large desktop boxes that served as emulators for the final product and would compile slash run machine code directly. By contrast, the 3DO team were all on Macintosh desktops and had only skeletal documentation, all in English that looked like it had been photocopied at Kinko's late at night. Large sections of this three-ring binder simply said TBD, and there were areas where the hardware was changing so fast that what was printed was already obsolete. The documentation was definitely not keeping up with the hardware evolution. While Cassidy brings up that, there's the likely chance that Toze contributed to potentially dozens of 3D in this era, but that they're just not known to us at this current moment in time. But I'm going to bet on my own hypothesis here, as informed by the games that we do know they worked on. Toze were simply more comfortable working in the 2D space, and largely sought out projects which spoke to that skill set, looked toward their console conversions of Namco's arcade series of point-blank light gun titles with very limited 3D elements, or the likes of their Dragon Ball fighting games which continued to leverage 2D sprites in front of relatively primitive 3D backgrounds. Between a number of other attempts at keeping the torch for two dimensions lit on a console that was quickly becoming more synonymous with the third. That shines a revealing light on Toze's relationship with Capcom. The ghost developer would have an easier transition into the sixth generation and working with 3D under Capcom's supervision. Thus, when Zero was delayed for the GameCube, Capcom threw Toze a softball in the shape of a Resident Evil spinoff which didn't have to be in the expected realms of what a numbered game should do. 
This is where things get murky, as because Toze was in the leading chair with Capcom acting as supervisor, there is no development history to dredge up. It's locked tighter than a Vestal Virgin's chastity belt, and for as much as I want to get in, I neither have the key nor the tools to bust it wide open. All we can go off is the working title for the game, Behind the Mask, implying that the game would be an FPS kinda arcade rail shooter sorta dealio. At best, you can merely guess as to why this path was chosen. Cassidy from Bad Game Hall of Fame going with, For starters, I'd be shocked if the success of Sega's The House of the Dead series didn't play at least some small part in this, as Capcom may have sought to assert their dominance in the zombie subgenre or otherwise provide the PlayStation with a comparable sort of shooting experience. Or perhaps Capcom's ambitions may have been even grander than that no less than the want to take Resident Evil to arcades where they could hope to challenge Sega's franchise more directly. The sales could also be another hypothesis, seen as the traditional games were going on a downward trend, which Cassidy also brings up, but wrongly conflates that Resident Evil 2 sold 11 million copies to Nemesis 3.5 million. She has to work on her reading comprehension as the 11 mil was contributed to RE sales altogether. But at this point, we're just playing blindfolded darts and none of us are hitting the mark. One thing that is for certain though is that Resident Evil Survivor was going to be changed for an American release. As with the usual naming difference, Resident Evil is the American name with Biohazard the original title for the franchise. See Resident Evil 7 Biohazard. So while we got Resident Evil Survivor, the original name was Biohazard Gun Survivor, a cheeky little nod to the fact that the game could be played with Namco's gun con peripheral. I haven't given out the exact time period for when development took place for the Survivor, but seeing as Toze was working on Project Zero alongside Survivor, that means we're in the late 90s. N 99 to be exact. The same year the Columbine tragedy happened, leading to the scapegoating of video games as the modern day Angra Manu, as opposed to the complex and chaotic nature of being human as it's easier to protest from an armchair and give yourselves pats on the back for accomplishing nothing than it is to work out real problems. Hell would be paid if a game titled Gun Survivor that was played using a gun peripheral was released over here, so Capcom made responses to protect their bottom line. Of course, you could still import and use your gun con if you wanted to, and that didn't stop a bunch of other games from releasing over here taking advantage of Namco's peripheral, so perhaps Capcom was being paranoid. That said, the game saw a release in 2000, first in Japan in January, then the EU in March, where IDOS Interactive published the game, and then America in August. A later PC release saw computers in China and Taiwan, there goes my social credit, in 2002. Trapped to the PlayStation 1, I used EPSXE as my emulator, though I forewent gun con controls as I don't own one. There is a way to set it up in case you do want to shoot some BOWs with a toy gun, but I'll stick to controller, thank you very much. Our tale opens up with a bit of a recount of what has happened in the Resident Evil universe, mainly the destruction of Raccoon City following the launching of a nuke and Umbrella's attempt to cover up their less than squeaky clean dealings in BOW creation. This was merely one outbreak spot as we jump to the actual plot of the game in media res. Zombies are already crawling about in an unnamed town as someone dangles from a helicopter. This is why you should ride them as whoever this blonde haired man is takes a tumble to a probable unwitting doom as the pilot crashes yet survives. Not unscathed however, as he seems to be suffering from amnesia. Armed at least with one of those infinite ammo handguns, this yet to be named protagonist finds the body of the only other person we've seen so far. His corpse is holding onto a dog tag etched with the name Ark Thompson, and with the logical thinking power of a second grader, this amnesiac is that person. You... you look familiar, but... Oh... oh. But I just can't remember. Ark Thompson, huh? Though I can't remember anything, I know that this was no way for anyone to die. What? 
Of course, Art doesn't know that, and before he can put two and two together, he gets accosted by a zombie who drops a key. A key that appears to be able to open a number of doors in this area, with Art choosing a route through the church as his preferred one to... Well, I'll get back to you on that. But hey, we can at least glean that this place is owned by Umbrella, seeing as the company's logo is plastered everywhere, including the church pulpit. A diary from the church manager enforces this idea as it covers the company's response to Raccoon's destruction. Blame whatever malformed corpse of Birkin that was annihilated in the blast for the downfall of the city, as well as new guidelines for employees to follow. Report anyone suspicious. Finding an exit out of the church, Ark runs into a few irregular mutations tied to a T-virus outbreak. That being the incidental zombie dog, not the deliberate B.O.W. version, which is the M.A. 39 Cerberus, and liquor, meaning some zombies have consumed enough material to start evolving. Someone on a payphone also accuses Ark of murder, though this unseen person makes the mistake of calling him Vincent, to which Ark believes that's his name. Three guesses as to who the dead blonde-haired man is. The Night Stalker, by the way, is Andy Holland, my usage of his name entailing his importance in this recap. We have three more locations to choose from. Art decides to have some fun in the arcade, unbeknownst to him that ducking in there has triggered an umbrella operation to begin in the city. Led by their commander, a squad of Undertaker-class BOWs, intelligent bioweapons deployed into high-risk zones to eliminate evidence and then die without a trace, starts sweeping the trash, leading to a few encounters between them and Ark, where he gets the best of them. Remember your mission! We're doing a clean sweep of the area! Everyone and everything must be cleansed! Now move out! Vincent, die! Andy gets a few shots on them as well from his position in the library. He was really targeting Ark, who he still calls Vincent, but that doesn't stop our guy from leaving the arcade and entering the sewers. The home of Andy, as his diary reveals that Vincent was the supreme commander of the city, but he wasn't a particularly nice guy. Of things to note, child experimentation and some unknown accident has put the whole place on edge. The two did have a conversation with Andy taking a picture of Vincent, which Ark looks at. It's a picture of himself. That begs the question why Andy thinks Ark is Vincent, though the man without a past begins to throw a conniption fit. No, this is me. I am Vincent. It was all my fault. Who are you? Wait. Please don't kill me. I, I didn't know anything about you then. Stop. That is, until a young boy interrupts the outburst who seemingly knows who Ark is and is deeply regretful over something before the man lost his memory. 
with an actual lead this time, Ark continues traveling through the sewers, entering the city's prison. A prison that housed the children in between their experimentation. Turns out that incident in the past that put everyone on edge is that Vincent killed 20 kids as recompense for their attempt to escape this place. The kids in question come from all over the world, though what they are used for is unknown. A journal from one of the imprisoned children reveals what procedure Vincent has ordered to be performed on them. Brain extraction. Something about genetic material, though this kid doesn't have the full deets. A lengthy trek through the prison leads Ark back into the sewers, which are lousy with MA-121 Hunter Alphas. And right before he gets back above ground, Ark has to deal with a trap from Andy, the janitor locking him in a room with two alligator or regular mutants. There's around too many of these creatures in this franchise, though luckily these two are handily taken down by the confused man, allowing him to reach the main umbrella office stationed in the city, the sight of which seems to awaken some of Ark's lost memories with a thorough investigation revealing a bit more of what happened before the helicopter crash. Umbrella. So this is where the city is controlled from. Oh. Oh. What's happening to me? Hello. Can you hear me? Who are you? Wh what are you doing? Answer me! Yet, before Ark can put these pieces together, a couple of T-103s, the mass-produced Mr. X Tyrant model, decide to make his life hell like it wasn't already. That said, a diary from Vincent is found explaining his actions. Vincent was a ruthless Umbrella Superior with untold ambition, who knew that those below him were planning a coup. The murdering of the 20 giddy pigs was a massive breaking point for a number of employees, and not only that, a spy was collecting evidence of Umbrella's misdeeds. So to put a kibosh on both, Vincent used a boy by the name of Lot, the kid from earlier, to suss out the spy while he started an outbreak as a smokescreen. It would be just another accident while Vincent would be able to protect his reputation and receive his promotion. Irony, party of one. A further ways into the office, Ark runs into another child listening to a taped message between Vincent and his mother. This is Lily, Lot's sister, who might as well be made out of cardboard. Still, the two are leads, and with the brother and sister running away, Ark gives chase leading to an opulent house. A house that belonged to the children's parents before they were caught up in the biohazard. With Lily bunkering down and Lot at the mountain facility, Ark makes his way there, but not before having a bit of a mishap and falling into a canyon swarming with 103s. Entering the factory proper, we finally learn why kids are needed by Umbrella. They secrete enough beta heterodon serotonin for the Tyrant Project. The only problem is that to gather enough, a surgeon must operate on their brains without any anesthesia, as BHN is only released in instances of high anxiety or fear. Oh, and if you thought Vincent stopped at merely collecting genetic material for tyrants, he also seems to be dabbling in R&D, his scientists finding a previously unknown DNA strand called the hypnos gene. Basically, it's eugenics condensed as the gene strengthens a body's cells by killing off weaker ones and enforcing stronger ones, leading to improved mutations and high durability. Implanted into a tyrant, Vincent's masterpiece is the hypnos T-type, housed somewhere in the factory. Fighting through a bunch of Umbrella B.O.W.s from what was previously mentioned, barring the Hypnos to the Plant 43 Ivy types, Ark reunites with Lot after saving him from a hunter, the boy finally explaining to the man that he was a detective hired by Leon S. Kennedy to investigate Sheena Island and Umbrella's presence here. Lot! I'm sorry. Please forgive me. What are you talking about? It's not your fault. Vincent is the one who caused everything. Well, I mean, I... 
You? What do you mean? You're the detective. Your name is Ark Thompson. What? Really? I'm not Vincent? Then why did you run away from me? Because I'm the one that told Vincent about you. Hello, I'm Vincent. I've been transferred to this facility to inspect it. Nice to meet you, sir. I know Commander Vincent. So I knew that you weren't him when I saw you. What? A spy? Hmm. Thank you. You are a good boy, Lot. So then I'm Ark, and not Vincent. Lot, do you know of any way to get off this island? My dad told me that there's a railway station up ahead from here. A railway station? I heard that it runs underground. Okay, we'll use that. Let's go get Lily. Go ahead! Hurry! We'll meet at the station! The self-destruction system has been activated. This island will self-destruct in 10 minutes. All the personnel must evacuate immediately. Repeat. All the personnel evacuate immediately. Ark was the spy mentioned who disguised himself as Vincent, as no one on the island knew what Vincent looked like, apparently, to collect info before Lot turned him into the real Goldman, leading to all the events I've covered up to so far. With that said, someone has activated Sheena Island self-destruct, but luckily a Resident Evil 2 railway station will get the three, Ark, Lot, and Lily, off the island. Stopping them, however, is the UT commander who tries sticking up Ark, but like in Resident Evil 1, the setting of the self-destruct system has unleashed all BOWs from their canisters, the Hypnos included. Human, you must be the leader of the cleaner unit sent by Umbrella to destroy the evidence of this biohazard. Whatever. I don't have time for your pathetic games. I have already sent the self-destruction system. This island will be gone in a matter of minutes. Adios, Ark. Butchering our main villain of this path, the Hypnos turns its cold gaze to Ark, who promptly fills it full of lead, incapacitating it. Not killing it, mind you, as when Ark and co. reach the helipad at the end of the railway, the Hypnos reemerges in an evolved state, looking more bestial. Another round of rounds pushes the genetic freak into a third evolution, transforming the tyrant into a hulking gorilla. Having enough firepower to put one down, Ark subdues the Hypnos and escapes with the children on a reserve helicopter. That the tyrant manages to sneak aboard, figuring that total cellular evaporation is the only way to put down this monstrosity, Ark fires the copter's missiles, hitting the Hypnos dead on, finally putting an end to Goldman's creation. Our story ends with the three of Ark, Lot, and Lily leaving Sheena, the detective presumably returning to Leon to brief him and the American government on his findings. The interesting piece about Survivor's story is that it technically can play out in a number of different ways. There are multiple pathways for you to choose from, such as opting to go through the church in the beginning and then the arcade on the way to the Umbrella Lab, leading to the events that I got, but you can select any one of the other paths to get wholly unique beat-for-beat -beat moments. I fought two crocodiles because I headed down that direction, but for you it may be something wildly distinct from this. Of course, that's why I specified beat for beat moments as that is all that really changes. The ongoing plot still has the same exact payoff with only minor changes happening depending on which route you've selected. Like, for specifics, instead of the UT commander getting killed in one path by Hypnos, it's Vincent or Andy. The sewer man who can show up out of nowhere and then disappear for the remainder of the story, depending on the path, 
in what amounts to an almost scene-for-scene -scene recreation with different dialogue. If anything, the importance of certain characters changes as my playthrough saw the UT commander take the main villain spot, as Vincent was dead from the start of the game, though he can become the main villain based on what you choose. And this honestly points out the kind of fragility of this story. This is another survival tale within the Resident Evil universe, but lacking sorely in Resident Evil 1, 2, and 3's character dynamics or interactions. Art Thompson as an entity written for this long-running and somewhat contrived tale connecting these games together is blander than milk bread, with the whole amnesia angle weighing him down further. You can call from scene one that Ark isn't Vincent, but the game painfully tries and fails to keep up this facade. Because of how telling the plot device is, the amnesia angle spoils the reveal, and it isn't that powerful of a revelation to begin with. Arg's only neat attribute is that somehow Leon knows this guy, which doesn't add anything to the former, merely pointing out how high up Leon has moved within the world if he's able to contract a pretty fearless private eye to investigate an island owned by Umbrella. Law and his sister, Lily, add nothing, being a bit part despite how desperately it wants to make Lot the instigator of this whole biohazard. All I can glean from the two is that Lot is protective of Lily and is a bit of a nonce, while Lily might as well not exist. She adds extremely little. Most of what this game has to offer is squarely situated in a sort of outside context, adding to the greater lore of Resident Evil. And on that front, I think Survivor does deserve a bit of credit. We never get a good look at Umbrella as a company outside their roguish elements. Wesker, Birkin, the Ashfords, and Nikolai are the faces plastered onto the pharmaceutical giant, but they don't represent the whole of it. All of them were taking advantage of their position in the company to break away from it. The citizens of Sheena Island paint the faceless employees as a pretty gray bunch, either unaware of the reality of Umbrella and their BOW manufacturing, or know about the seed of your underbelly but are in a tight spot as there isn't much they can do besides follow orders. There's a note within the labs of the island detailing how one of the surgeons assigned to tyrant production has massive moral qualms about what he has to do, seeing as he has to euthanize kids without anesthesia to gather the necessary BHN for the bioweapon. This guy is in a lose-lose situation, as either he continues doing what he's told, sinking further and further into depravity and maintaining his position of expendable worker, or he stops and gets murked by Vincent or the company, whichever comes first. An interesting little wrinkle to this is that not even Vincent Goldman, the guy who runs Sheena Island, is immune to office politics. He got to his position by strategically taking out his competitors so he was the only one able to receive a promotion. That apparently is against Umbrella's code of conduct, thus Vincent has to hide the fact that his sabotage put him into the leadership role he has now. Continuing further, Umbrella does have standards as minuscule as they are because the outbreak on the island was started as a cover-up. If Umbrella higher-ups caught wind that Vincent murdered test subjects to flex his superiority, they would have called in the USS for immediate action due to the risk. Again, the rogue elements of Umbrella do nothing but hinder the company's goals, so when someone isn't on the same page, they're a liability even if they don't decide to secede from the conglomerate. Inadvertently, this would do more damage to Umbrella's reputation as Vincent stayed on payroll. Harvesting the non-serotonin and hypnos genes was his job. His only crimes committed under company rulings were his ambition, killing other candidates for promotion, and his ruthlessness, murdering valuable test subjects to send a message to those that try to escape, and browbeating the civilization of Sheena. If he wasn't under pressure to keep those little blips in his career covered up, you could say that Vincent was a good company man that followed exactly what Umbrella wanted from their higher-ups to the letter. People like Morpheus D. Duvall and the Ashfords were excommunicated from Umbrella because they were liabilities, ironic as keeping people like Vincent on the employed list would end up doing just as much damage as someone like Morpheus to the company's reputation pending their criminal trial. Sheena Island is just another piece connected to Umbrella's guilty verdict, an outcome they couldn't avoid because while they may have splintered themselves away from bad actors who sought greater power or riches within the bottomless well of viral experimentation and black market sales, who remained followed what was outlined to them by the company. Umbrella was a bad seed through and through with even their own employees more than capable of wreaking havoc under company guidelines.
I think before I cover anything else, I have to go into the voice work as, oh boy, we are in classic Resident Evil's domain. For some of you, which includes me, that's a good time. For others wanting a somewhat professionally voiced experience, you are not getting it here. I don't know if this was a case of bad directing or bad performances, but the end result is a fever dream of strangeness. In the main seat is Patrick Harlan's Art Thompson, a man verging between two distinct voice styles. Bored surprise and dry obviousness. There is no in-between and all his scenes pinball from one to the other depending on who or what he's interacting with. Patrick provides Ark with no texture to anything, making him more or less a blank slate that sometimes undersells his overreactions, like when he believes he's Vincent in the sewers, or blandly states the obvious. I promise, don't cry anymore, Lily. I may have been a bad person, but that was before. That's not who I am now. I will save these two kids. I swear it. Lily, you hide here. I'll go find your brother and then come back for you. They are creating these monsters on this island. For a main character, this would be a death knell in anything wanting to come across as super serious, but because Resident Evil has always worn schlock on its sleeve, like with the first game having FMV cutscenes with real life actors, or even some of the later games like 4's off the cuff one liners, Ark feels right at home in this somewhat wacky series. If Jill, Chris, Leon, and Claire were aiming for seriousness and got hit with the eccentric stick, Ark is the opposite in that he's somewhat goofy trying to play off serious. His utter lack of emotion clashes so hard with this game's undercurrent of child exploitation and experimentation that it inadvertently catches the lightning in the bottle that makes the first few Resident Evil games special in their voice work. It's so hard to hate Patrick's performance as Ark as it's so far below a zero that it's a ten. The only conundrum to solve if this was intentional or not, and even then, that doesn't affect the end product, merely explain it. That's right. At the request of my friend, Leon S. Kennedy, I came here to investigate. Oh, yes. I remember. I remember everything. Tell me the truth. You are a spy, aren't you? I'm not Vincent, I'm Art. Blonde is struck down with having an inexplicable British accent that becomes more noticeable the longer he speaks. And when I mean British, it's right proper English with the accent and everything. Making this even funnier, Colleen Lanky, Lot's voice actress, is Canadian, meaning this was a deliberate decision, but you only find out that Sheena Island is adjacent to the EU near the end of the game, so this direction comes off like you're stuck in a time warp. It's jarring and only adds to the sheer absurdity. Michael Nash Tut's Vincent Goldman sounds like another Goldman reeking of the same ham and cheese that the House of the Dead is stuffed with. Unabashedly evil, but at least this fits the character of Vincent, as it is the only part of the VO that doesn't seem odd on the surface. It says a lot that the rest of the audio within the game is fairly standard and barely worth mentioning. Survivor sounds like a Resident Evil game through and through. Trademark jingles and sound effects abound, with the only thing to note being the music which does have its moments. This isn't hitting in the same ballpark as some of the other Resident Evil games like 4, but damn do tracks like Last Opponent, the theme of Hypnos 2 and 3, or Heaven on Earth provide a bit of ambience or intensity to the OST. Underrated might be the word if it weren't for the overabundance of somewhat moody tracks. Get in the hell! 
helicopter. It's still alive. Visually speaking, Survivor is a pretty messy game. The jump from the third person to first person providing a bit of dark insight into how some creatures look in the space. Hunters might have gotten the worst end of the stick, looking less threatening and more dopey, their run animation doing them no favors. The dogs get hit with the bad side of this game's presentation as well, looking more like a smear of pixels than an actual rotting corpse. For comparison, and a fair one at that since I'm not even going to bring up the Dreamcast, these dogs and hunters look much worse than their RE1 counterparts. That was four years ago, meaning Toze's unfamiliarity with 3D definitely bit them in the ass. But if you think they look terrible and are animated oddly, Ark and Lot are leagues below them. There is one particular scene that always gets brought up when talking about Survivor, and that's when Lot protects Lily from Ark with a bat. Mostly because of his run animation. Two points to bring up. He's overtly animated, meaning the distance he actually travels should be much further than where he goes. This is an issue with tweening and motion frames, as when animating something like a run, you have to make sure body movement matches the distance traveled while making sure it doesn't carry too much or not enough weight. Sprinting, as Lot is doing, means you have less frames overall and less cycles. Lot has around six cycles of running when he should only have two or three in the scene. It once again points to Toze being uncomfortable with 3D, which the world design supports as well. Bland, basic hallways make up the majority of Survivor, with only a few locations like the arcade or hospital really sticking out. There's nothing gripping with the sewers or even Tyrant Factory. It's all bland, mushed together slop that is boring to look at. There's no central location like the mansion or police department that catches your attention and becomes a character to itself, and the size and scope of Sheena was done better in both Three Nemesis and Code Veronica. There's no character to Sheena like with the other big locations. On the whole, the performance's weirdness carries this presentation, a feather in the cap in a somewhat ugly and bland looking game. Resident Evil Survivor is a first-person survival horror, setting the stage way later for what Biohazard and Village would approach with. Like, obviously, Biohazard, 7, and Village take inspirations from other first-person shooters on the gameplay front, but a part of me wants to believe that Capcom remembered the four Gun Survivor games. Instead of like last time, I can confirm there's a difficulty select as it's the first thing you choose before you enter the nightmare. 
Unlike in some of the other Resident Evil games, however, all difficulty changes are enemy damage and health, plus increasing or decreasing the amount of ammunition you gain from pickups. On the whole, Gun Survivor is on the easier side, with Ark having some sturdiness to him on the normal setting, and only a few attacks in the game reaching maximum danger levels. This is perhaps because of Survivor's whole shtick. It is a first-person shooter, yes, but a light gun game of the era. Instead of opting for a controller and choosing to use a European ISO as the US version has the gun con option removed, you can set up a Namco gun con as your controller, allowing you to feel right at the arcades within your own home. This does take a bit of pre-gaming on your end, configuring EPSXE and owning a gun con, but it is an interesting little detail that comes included with most copies of Survivor. If you're wondering, that does mean the game has quite simplified controls. Left stick moves both arc and the camera, with the right stick doing diddly dick. While there is a confirmation and back button, picking up items in the game world, going through doors, and even examining the environment involves bumping into whatever you're wanting to grab or go through. Coming off of a classic Resident Evil game, this can take some getting used to, especially with the doors, but after a while you do get used to it. While not specifically mentioned within the controls, which there are three types when using a controller that changes the placements of the actions, Ark does have the ability to run. Take full advantage of this as Ark's standard movement speed is on the slower end matching heat death of the universe at times. A little quibble about the run though. Ark has to be moving forward to run. Since the left stick controls both movement and camera, there is no strafing. Pushing forward moves him forward and back back, but left and right turn him a la tank controls. You can turn while moving forward keeping your speed, but be prepared to fimble bimble around sometimes due to the quirkiness of this movement system. For actual direct combat, pressing the assigned cursor button, one of the bumpers slash triggers in my case, pulls up your equipped weapon's reticle. Movement from this point forward is disabled, the left stick moving the cursor almost all over the screen instead. Aiming straight up and down is one action you are limited from. Likewise, the confirmation button becomes attack, allowing you to pump lead into anything that wants you dead. This is where your HUD comes into play. The HUD always displays what weapon you've equipped, how many remaining shots it has in its clip, as well as your condition. Per the RE baseline, green is fine, yellow slash orange is caution, red is danger. This color system isn't so much a factor in Survivor as it is more or less a traditional health system with enemies not having attack types opened up depending on your condition. Ammo and reloading in Survivor is a bit different from the mainline titles in that reloading from the pause menu is actually the secondary way to load up your guns. Shooting a full clip from most guns, the grenade and rocket launchers, the odd ones as they basically don't have downtime, will lead to Ark automatically reloading his armament. The single, most impactful aspect of this is that you cannot pause when Ark auto-reloads. You have to let him finagle a clip back into his gun before you can open up the pause menu. Reloading from menu circumvents this, and against tougher threats is the better choice as you can continue to suppress whatever you're fighting with no downtime. Another element key in this situation is that while all the other weapons need ammo, the handguns all have infinite ammo to work with. That means you can be a bit more reckless with the handguns, or choose to use them in order to save other guns for specific targets. Within Survivor, there are eight guns at Ark's disposal. Four handguns, A through D, the shotgun, the grenade launcher, the Mugnum, and the unlockable rocket launcher. Outside of handgun A, which Ark starts with, our detective must find the other weapons out in the field. This leads me to level design for a bit. Survivor is a linear affair, but instead of A to B, it's more like A1 or A2 or A3 to B. All roads lead to the same place, but the journey in between will be divergent. Take as an example the opening section of the game. After killing the first zombie, he drops a key that unlocks the church, the restaurant, or the movie theater. What you encounter in each of those areas, from enemies to puzzles, is wholly unique, but you can only go through one. Once you pick which area or stage you want to blast through, you cannot backtrack. This individuality bleeds over to item pickups as well, with certain routes containing diaries or handguns specific to them. Story is also affected, but I already brought that up in that tab. Most item pickups are the usual affair. Herbs of three colors, green, red, and blue, that you can combine to heal yourself of damage, poison, or both. 
first aid spray that heals fully at the cost of your in-game ranking, guns and their ammo, and files. All of them can be viewed, examined, or combined from the pause menu, which also has a map of whatever area you're in. Back to the weapons, while the four handguns operate the same in theory, they all have little nuances from each other. Handgun A is the basic option. Medium to low damage, somewhat fast firing speed, pretty average reload, and 17 bullets in the clip. Useful for almost any situation, barring the final boss, only if you aren't confident with it. Handgun B has the lowest damage across the board for all the weapons, slow reload and 15 bullets in its magazine, but it makes up for the shortcomings by having a hairpin trigger. It fires as fast as you can press attack, granting it high DPS. C is stated in-game as being an upgraded A, but it has B's clip size, a somewhat slow firing speed, average damage, and a fast reload. The last of the handguns is D, favoring high damage with a fast reload, but the fire rate is slow and D is the only gun with active recoil. Moving to the stronger armaments, the shotgun hits hard and can perforate multiple enemies bunched together, having decent fire speed but a slow reload. The grenade launcher comes with three ammo types, weakest to strongest, flame, explosive, acid, and does the work of the shotgun much better, and the magnum is a hand cannon. Outside a few instances, it kills on hit but has slow reload and fire speed. While the aiming cursor typically is where your projectiles will go, the shotgun does have a bit of spread, and the grenade launcher fires an actual object as opposed to using hitscan technology. To help facilitate hitting what you're aiming for, once you damage a target from any distance, mind you, as if you can see it, you can hit it, Ark will auto-lock onto whatever BOW he hits, aiming squarely center of mass. You can still shift the cursor, however, while maintaining auto-lock, offsetting some enemy stun frames where they can inadvertently cause you to miss. The auto lock does have an exploration variant that highlights doors and items as well, though it can lead to some whiplash if enemies are abound. Speaking of them, outside of two unique threats, every other enemy within Survivor is from Umbrella's greatest hits. That means the standard zombie makes up the lower end mobs. Only threatening in big groups and if moving fast, but can otherwise be gunned down in mass. Ivy's web spinners and downgraded black tigers fit here as well, only notable due to their knack for poisoning, needing the blue herb to cure and masquerading what your actual health is. Hating fire, Ivy's and their strength and brethren detest flame grenades and go down almost in one hit to them. New to Survivor are the Undertakers, toting MP5s and tackling targets as a tenacious team, but their lower health, lower than a zombie, makes their hitscan weapon only dangerous in a no-hit run. Moving up in the world, we have zombie dogs, lickers, and moths. Trading health and defense for speed, zombie dogs annoy you with their higher movement capabilities and lunges mangling your auto lock. They don't hit too hard, but are amongst the more aggravating adversaries. Lickers retain their medium threat level from Resident Evil 2, though they are less belligerent seeing as they have to hear you. Walking is inaudible to them unless you are right in their face. Their sloth-like reflexes make them easy to avoid, and even in combat, their tongue pierce hits relatively minor, and their lunge while damaging can be consistently avoided. Lickers mostly stall you out with high defense and climbing on ceilings. Moths, as in two, have the wall-like constitution of a licker aided by flight and moderate damage, making them a surprising threat if you can't stun them. Around three hits puts you into a lower health state, so do take care to move. In the upper echelon of Umbrella's products are the Hunters, T-103s, and other bosses. Hunters retain their high rating on the Umbrella board of fuck your shit up with powerful claw swipes and lunges mixed with impeccable movement options. One is dangerous, two or more is a disaster, and you can't run from them. T-103s, meanwhile, are classic lumbering titans. Moving slow and less pissed, and clobbering you with devastating punches and clubbing blows. Distance is your friend, and so is mag dumping. Bosses fit into this last description as well, with the dangerous crocodile duo and Hypnos needing you to take advantage of space and movement to avoid a grisly fate. One last detail on enemies. Whatever you find in a room will only be what you fight in the room. Overlap is non-existent in the game, there only being one instance of two enemy typings populating a room the T-103 with two dogs. Dying is a rarity in this game, but it does reveal a major aspect of Survivor's design. 
there is no saving, not traditionally speaking. When you die, you have the option to save and can restart at what amounts to a checkpoint if you want, the only other instance of saving happening after a completed run. As with other RE titles, your performance is ranked at the end of the game, the major factors calculating your letter base grade being time, accuracy, continues, and first aid spray usage. Essentially, be quick, be accurate, and be alive. This is where a neat little facet makes itself known. Continuing to shoot an enemy while they are in their dying animation counts towards your accuracy. Thank you, Carcinogen, for the neat factoid, as you can bolster your accuracy by shooting dying enemies. Once you complete the game, you can load your completed save to enter New Game Plus, allowing you to find all the other weapons you missed and blow through the game with a full arsenal. And seeing as the lowest time to get for an S rank is an hour 30, Survivor does endear itself to speed. What I really appreciate about Survivor is how it handles the whole Resident Evil weapon system for the most part. Some of the later Resident Evil struggle with balancing their loadouts, with some weapons having superfluous or too niche roles while others have only a few weapons that are honestly useful. While I might get flagged for this, the TMP trumps all the pistols within Resident Evil 4, as you're using a pistol to set up melee attacks, something that the TMP does much better with more ammo. The pistol in 5 is the tool for almost everything barring higher tier monsters, so shotgun or magnum. 6's lineup is all over the damn place between the four campaigns. And 7 has the flamer and high power ammo, not fulfilling any capacity. While the shotgun and handgun see are lame ducks, the other 5 weapons, as the rocket launcher is purposely overpowered for getting an S rank, slot handily into Ark's hands. Handgun A is the basis for every handgun going forward from 4, fulfilling the role of an all rounder in any given situation. No matter what you're fighting, it has some usage due to its somewhat solid damage and firing speed able to put some of the most dangerous threats in the game into hit stun. You can outright kill T-103s with the pistol easily by mag dumping, saving those precious grenades for something far more dangerous. All it takes is a bit of skill and some luck to deal with the high-end threats like the Hunters with the starter pistol, though this is where the other ones come into their own. Handgun B might as well be a machine gun. It fires so fast that it's less than stellar damage isn't honestly felt. It can chew through hordes of basic zombies and can frequently put larger enemies into stun, though since it lacks hard damage and relies on the thousand needle strategy, once a monster gets up close, you have to rely on dodging and movement to get back into optimal range. Gunning down a hunter from far away with B is what it prefers, so when they start running up on you, the lack of stopping power becomes more than noticeable. D, meanwhile, prefers the close range. With only having 8 shots and recoil to contend with, the Nambu can be a bit finicky to use when first trying it out. The multitude of considerations you have to take in with handgun D means an untrained hand is better off of A or B, but the raw damage output of D makes it quite scary when having a hunter right in your face. The whites of their eyes still runs true even in the modern age. But that's the beauty of the handguns, the ability to quickly switch between them. There's no inventory management you have to deal with in Survivor, probably explaining why items are so sparse, so whenever you collect a new weapon, it will always be with you. You can go from sniping a hunter or liquor with pistol A or B and then switch to D for when they get so close that overwhelming firepower is needed. This creates a sort of strategic aspect with choosing your weapons, as you have to weigh the positives and negatives against each other. Using one of the handguns means having ammo spare for the bigger artillery in either a tight spot or against a boss. Facing off against a single hunter with a pistol is more than manageable, if a bit fear inducing. But once you start staring down two or more, do you opt to play safely with the shotgun or grenade launcher, or continue with a pistol in the hopes of avoiding unnecessary damage so you can use the bigger guns for later threats? The grenade launcher has its own microcosm with the grenade type, specifically fire and acid. Fire doesn't hit creatures as hard as the other grenades, though it still does some decent damage but ivies shrivel away when put under the heat. Do you load in fire grenades to avoid the poisonous spit of an ivy, or snipe away with a handgun knowing that you can keep a few more valuable grenades in stock? Acid, meanwhile, is dangerous to most living creatures, putting most right on their ass. Once again, do you opt for other grenade types to take out a threat, or indulge in some pistoleering in the hopes that you can keep some for a hard encounter? 
Maneuvering around attacks has its own dichotomy as well. Measuring between standing your ground and hoping to defeat whatever you're fighting before it gets close to you, or attempting to dodge and repost. The more sturdy of threats have tells for their attacks, like Lickers, Hunters, and T-103s with their lunges or double axe handles. Dodging is the safer option, but you might have to run away or turn around having to deal with bumbling about while the creature reacquires your scent. On the other hand, laying into one with a hail of gunfire might see an opportunity for a hit stun to save your ass. Knocking a licker or hunter out of the air, while difficult, leaves them scrambling on the floor giving you time to execute them. Dogs too suffer from this, a well-placed shot easily stopping a pounce and hurting them greatly. Do you choose a riskier option knowing that you might eat a hit, or play it safe knowing that you won't kill a monster as fast as you would like? These snapshot decisions are one of my favorite aspects of Survivor, entirely tied to how this game's weapon and movement system are handled. Because you have to re-lock on each time you lose the auto-lock, it makes placing your shots that much more important as you don't have the classic RE auto-aim to help you out. This makes encounters somewhat terrifying as distance plays a major factor. Combine that with the amount of enemies you have to face in rooms, Zombies usually flood any room they're in, dogs and hunters can come in packs of three, liquors and pears, plus their unique movement paces, and lo and behold, a feeling of dread sprints up your spine when a B.O.W. is staring you right in the face. I was legitimately worried whenever something was dead in front of me, something I never experienced in the classic RE games due to the camera difference and the auto-aim. Having something staring you in the face, taking up your attention as who knows what else is getting closer to you is horrifying, and this applies to all the enemies. A singular zombie can tie you up, and without the fixed camera angles, you can't tell how close or far its buddies are. There's a reason why Survivor urges you to wear headphones during gameplay, as sound is tracked realistically. Something on your left will tip off that ear, and vice versa. It is the only massive positive from the presentation that isn't hokey B-movie schlock. Survivor does have a propensity to be stingy with its ammo drops, more so than other Resident Evil games. Usually, once you reach about halfway into the experience, you start receiving more bullets for your moderate weapons like the shotgun or grenade launcher, those two being Leon and Claire's mid-game standard armament. Here, however, the shotgun is hampered by its lack of ammo drops, that it serves more the role of specific enemy killer than becoming a main weapon. This isn't like the case of the Magnum where the gun's definitive firepower should only be used in rare instances like bosses. The shotgun doesn't hit the same as the grenade launcher or Magnum, yet gets around the same amount of pickups as the latter two. This makes it too niche for its own good, not hitting hard enough to justify usage against bosses, yet lacking the ammo to use against common mobs or specialty enemies. I only sought the shotgun when dealing with hunters, and more times than not, I had to downgrade to mag dumping with the pistol to shut them down. Ultimately, I think the shotgun is pretty surplus to arms because of this whole conundrum, probably explaining why Claire and Leon get one or the other. There's too much competition between the medium grade weapons, leaving one with the short end of the barrel. What does suck is that the shotgun does have a good niche in that it hits wide and penetrates targets but the low amount of ammo within the game does shoot it in the leg, at least the path that I went on. That's also kind of a negative in the shape of you have to unlearn a few instincts the genre instills in you. Exploration in Survivor more often than not locks you on a path with no way to go back, so if you didn't want to go into the arcade, tough cookie. It makes searching for items a bit of a hassle as I don't know if where I'm heading is progress or optional, with even the in-game map not being particularly clear on the distinction either. This leads back into the previous issue as maybe there is an abundance of shotgun ammo in the game. The path I went down just didn't provide me with any. Likewise, what paths you choose will lead you to the other handguns, two of which have their role to play, the last one might as well be an empty slot. Handgun C supposedly is on par of Handgun A, the only difference is being total ammo in the clip, 15 as opposed to 17, a faster dry reload, and slightly more damage. That's on paper. In practice, it fires slower so its DPS is smaller than Handgun A's, which in turn means it does less damage. The faster dry reload barely has any worth when you can still reload from the pause menu with no downtime, 
leaving C without any role in your arsenal besides that of a paperweight. On the replay, these issues lessen over time, but the first playthrough gets stricken with being shoved into situations where you're underprepared against certain enemy types through no fault of your own. Mostly the hunters, but before them, while the general controls aren't too bad on controller, dogs are the first real bump in the game showcasing how kinda inaccurate they are. The neat little feature I mentioned in gameplay falls apart when dealing with dogs as the auto lock only works if you manage to keep them stun locked. Once a dog manages to run free or get into your peripheral, good luck landing a shot as they're too wily to get a beat on from any range besides right in fucking front of you. What doesn't help is that you are limited to how far off you can aim around the screen, as the cursor isn't able to go to the edges, making liquor somewhat bothersome to gun down from their ceiling perches. There's a reason why I ran away from most, as their attacks are easy to dodge and their health pool coupled with their tendency to climb to the tops of rooms made it more of a hassle to stay and fight. Back to the bitches, their tendency to move all around will probably be the leading cause for your accuracy rating tanking, as avoision is highly unlikely in any room with dogs, as they move faster than you do and can body block. Coincidentally, hunters also have this distinction as well, but they are more active about it. If dogs are bumps, hunters are roadblocks. Not only do they retain their scary amount of aggression and movement speed, you no longer have traditional Resident Evil auto-aim. The auto-lock in Survivor is serviceable, until a hunter jumps into the air. That counts as outside the peripheral, disengaging the auto lock, leaving you scrambling to train your gun back on the reptilians as they casually hit you below finer caution. Never go into an encounter with hunters without a herb on backup or stronger guns, as while you can stun lock alone ones of pistols A and B, having two or three on your ass is a recipe for disaster as the auto lock gets screwy with who it wants to track. And as said previously, you can't run past hunters. They will do everything in their power to jump ahead of you, cutting off escape. Combined with the other problems mentioned, and you can see why I absolutely despise dealing with the reptiloid bioweapons, and dedicated the shotgun to exterminating them if I had the ammo for it. Even killing them as a thorn in the side is with the shotgun, I couldn't wager how many shots they needed before they bit it. Sometimes one, maybe two, or possibly three to four shots to take one down. I'm already on a tight budget with the shotgun as is, so not having a definitive number to count down towards as I'm firing shots led me more often than not to waste ammo. It speaks volumes that a battalion of undertakers, enemies who can casually blast you from across the screen as their gun is hit scan, are less aggravating than a singular hunter. What I can say is that this rendition of them is keeping in the tradition of the hunter's right bastardry in this franchise. I was pleasantly surprised with Resident Evil Survivor. I've always heard that this was one of the bad Resident Evil games. It lumped with the other spin-offs in the trash can. While it does have faults with weapon redundancy and the hunter sucking the life force out of me anytime I had to deal with one, they're relatively minor compared to what this game does right. Gunplay is fun and has a bit of strategy to it, and the controls are quite responsive for a console FPS in this era. Slather on top a who's who of Resident Evil BOWs to shoot at, of the time voice performances, and a short runtime that ties very well with the game's replayability, and I fail to see why Survivor has the reputation that it does. It's worth checking out with or without your gun con. <coughs> I'm still surprised that three other Gun Survivor titles are out there. It's such an oddball series within the Capcom roster pertaining to their two closest ideological franchises, Resident Evil and Dino Crisis. And even stranger, the second Gun Survivor is a remake of Code Veronica, while Dino Stalker has absolutely nothing to do with Dino Crisis outside of shooting dinosaurs. It has about as much in common with Dino Crisis 1 and 2 as 3 does with 1 and 2. Capcom's evolution within this age of gaming and the seventh generation takes some screwy turns. As for every Dead Rising or Dragon's Dogma, you get titles like Clock Tower 3 or Gotcha Force, 
revealing that Capcom worked on the Gundam Versus series since Gacha uses the same skeleton. There's some real deal weird shit in the catalog like Under the Skin, Gregory Horror Show, or Ghost Trick. I can't vouch for Under, but Horror Show and Ghost Trick are fucking sweet cop that remaster for Trick. And that's not even covering the licensed Capcom games like Disney's Magical Mirror starring Mickey Mouse, or their Rosario 2 Vampire visual novel, that game getting a sequel from Compile Heart, the record of Argus War and Hyperdimension Neptunia developer. Anywho, this show is made possible with the likes of the moviegoers within the peanut gallery and inner circle. Consider buying a ticket at patreon.com forward slash let's talk about games, no apostrophe in the let's, for behind the scenes access to LTA scripts, thumbnails, other bonus material, your name in the credits, and early screenings of episodes, plus the Showtime reels. With January and Pokemon Snap in the rear view mirror, February's home to Sewer Surfing starring Team and TO3 on the GBA. Cowabunga! And as always, this showing of Resident Evil Survivor is over, but stay tuned for our next feature involving massive bugs, pirates of the weather variety, and our old pal Keiji Inafune.